this is the perfect segue to, to just talk about the legend of Big Poppy. You guys have done a great job of painting the picture of what he was off the field. Uh, I, I'd love to just go through some of the most memorable moments <laughs> and what you remember. And we could start anywhere, but it, it just feels like October 2004 is the place to start. And before we even got to the Yankee series, the first big magic moment that he had in that postseason was extra inning walk-off homer to end the series, to end that ALDS against the Angels. Either you guys Jared have Wasper. any memories, yeah, any memories of that one or a story behind that that particular home run? I, de- I definitely remember the game because I, I had the win in my back pocket, I thought, and I think Laddie, <laughs> Laddie tied the game and, and uh, gave me a no decision. <laughs> but um, that was one of my favorite games of all time that I – that I pitched in and, um, you know, just talking about David on the field, you know, flowering and coming to life and the legend of big poppy coming to, you're talking about, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to put your finger on that because, you know, I was in, I was in triple a in, in the beginning part of Oh three. So I don't remember like the home run in Anaheim. Cause I would have been down babysitting Jeremy Jambi at that time down in triple a cause he had got sent down. And, um, you know, I was a guy who was, got stamped by the end of 03 as a, as a, as a major league baseball player. Right. And David really wasn't totally stamped as a, as a frontline major league player until the end of 03. And it's hard to put your finger exactly when that happens. When does the outside public, when does the entire coaching staff, when does the organization as a whole think of David Ortiz as a frontline major league, you know, middle of the lineup guy. And it's, it's not always easy to put your finger on it, but uh, you know, like you said, leading into the playoffs, no one even remembers the fact that he ended that series because of what happened in the Yankees series. But I know it was a joy for me to be in the locker room that night and be able to to, to, to kind of wipe the sweat off my brow and say that this series is over and good thing we put it to bed. Yeah, that was a Jeez, moment. So, well, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> People, there's guys that hit good pitching. There's guys that do damage throughout the 162-game schedule but they get to the postseason and they can't hit good pitching. They'll put up magnificent numbers throughout a season. Derek Jeter is one of the greatest in this game has ever seen, right, on that big stage. That's where he made his name. You know, Derek would go through and play great games and dominate through a season, but he never, like, had the 35 and 125, like the Nomar Garcia Pars or Alex Rodriguez. So Derek played, you know, built a niche in the postseason and winning rings. David Ortiz, when I tell you this, there's no greater RBI guy in big situations in the history of this game. And Manny Ramirez, we, you know, we played together with, and there's nobody better with two outs, tough righty on, and, and Manny would do whatever he had to do, right? But David, it seemed like he would drive in 120, and I'm telling you, 111 of those were big RBIs. They were sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth innings. Uh, the home runs were ginormous when we needed it it wasn't just a bit, bunch of fluff and you know to put up numbers in the leagues hard everybody's big leaguers but you know though you understand like there's guys that put up monster numbers because they're just better than people but when a push comes to shove can you hit good pitching you know and i think that's what separated david ortiz was late in the games the jared washburn walk-off home run this confidence that started kind of building like bronson said he still was having to prove to everybody that that he deserved to play. But as this season went on, there was no one better. And he started having this confidence that you saw he was a star now. There was no, like, common player. You know, I was a common baseball player. He turned into a star, you know, that season. So about three or four months of just pure swag and dominating against good pitching with big RBIs. And because we were a team now. We were a team that came in there and the radio shows were blasting Theo and who are these guys? And, you know, and then you looked at that club in 03 with David in that lineup. I mean, it, it broke a lot of records in that offense. Billy Miller won the batting title, hit ninth. People forget about that. The 2003 American League batting title champion, he was our nine hole hitter. And David Ortiz sat there and drove in, like I said, 110 with 31 home runs and really didn't start starting every day till that middle to the end of May. I want, yeah. I, want to, I want to ask something, Jason, can I ask Kevin something here? Because I was curious. I was asked about this the other night, and I don't know the answer because I wasn't in the batting cage with you guys. But is there something 
that David, you know, they asked why he was so good in big playoff situations. And I felt like where David had exploded from coming from Minnesota and doing what he did in 03 and 04, maybe he had figured out how to shore up the inner half of the plate or some place in his some place in his in his repertoire that he felt like he couldn't cover in the past that he got better at. Was there something you ever had that conversation with him about? Yeah, hundred percent, B. And you know, David and I, we hit in the same group. It was me, Manny, and David that hit in the batting practice rounds, and that was on the field. We followed Manny like a little kid, you know. And literally, Manny, you know, worked very hard behind the scenes in the cages and a lot of soft toss, a lot of T work. But David Ortiz was the big left-handed guy. The book was to pound him in late, uh, you know, hard in. And I would sit on deck a million times and watch Joe Torre and these Yankees try to pound David Ortiz in with the fastball that, like Bronson said, he worked extremely hard to shorten this swing, pull those hands in, almost like Barry Bonds was able to keep a fastball inside fair. And that means pulling your hands in and being quick to that spot to get that barrel squared up on an inside pitch to keep it fair down the line. And he mastered it then. But there was a book, pound him in late, hard in, elevate. It was no more. <laughs> they kept trying to pound him in, and I would sit there and trot Nixon. I'd be like, bro, we're on deck. Why not let us beat you? They kept throwing inside to David, and it would be a two, three run home run. It seemed like every time. And so, yes, Bronson, that's what he did. He worked hard with Manny. He worked hard in the cages. But that inside pitch, because Manny wasn't a pull hitter. Manny, Manny drove the ball right center. That's where his strength was, like a Miguel Cabrera. Manny couldn't pull home runs. So when David would hit home runs in batting practice, a lot of them were left center, dead center, dead center, big power, right? They'd play games. Well, I couldn't hit the ball dead center. I was pull power. David turned into pull power, but he can go foul pole to foul pole. Yeah, you were talking about how just how he would hit great pitching in those big moments in October. I, sort of looking back on those two series against the Yankees in, in 03 and 04 today. How about this? Starting game four in the in the 2003 ALCS through the end of the 2004 ALCS, in the eighth inning or later, he went seven for 15, hit a 500 on base. It was, let me try to remember this now, I think it was three homers, a double, and a triple. <laughs> How about that for handling the big moment late, right? Yeah, I don't think... I don't, just, yeah, go ahead, B. I was going to say, I, I don't think people realize what Kevin was talking about earlier, too, is that there is a huge distinction between what you do during the regular season, no matter how good of a player you are, and when you play in the big moments. And it's not, it's not only because the pressure is there, you're facing better pitching every night in the playoffs, but it's also because you don't have many opportunities, right? You don't get many at-bats in your career in a World Series game, no matter how many times you've been there, including a guy like David. And for, for you to feel like when he was at the plate with our backs against the wall, up against the greatest reliever of all time, the greatest closer of all time, you still felt like we were in the driver's seat with David at the plate. And you couldn't even say that with Manny at the plate. And and to, to have that distinction of a guy that makes you feel cozy, you're watching him from the dugout and you feel like you're on the edge of your seat, but you still feel very confident that he can pull something out in a situation like that is absolutely remarkable. Some of the greatest players who have ever played the game a guy like Clayton Kershaw, right, has gotten a little bit of flack for not performing up to those same regular season standards as he does in a playoff game at times. Or a guy like Albert Pujols, you know, and it is hard to do this on that stage for anybody. And he did it multiple years. It's absolutely remar remarkable. Yeah, well, let me point out that Glanville had a pinch triple. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, while you guys were busy playing uh, mm -hmm. seven hour games against the Yankees, Glanville had a pinch, pinch triple against the fish. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, Doug, you want to tell them all about it? Comes up about seven times a year. It was off a sinker, which normally I hit off my shin or hit it into the dirt or missed it completely. So I, that was a moment. Beat him out, though. <laughs> yeah, worst case scenario. Yeah. Okay, Doug. Yeah. I mean, well, and and you talk about these these big moments. Do you do you recall? A, any of the reflections he had after those moments, like what kind of conversations came uh, in those moments after the celebration, the the discussion, what, what did he talk about? How did he frame it? He started, he started knowing that he was the best. I mean, he started knowing and he started becoming a very smart hitter. David's always been a smart hitter, 
he's a guess guess hitter. You know, Manny was a, a see the ball, uh, you know, hit the ball guy. You know, and we always used to laugh because we'd beat teams up, and you know, you'd hear have all the stuff that we had the signs and uh, you know all of this this silly nonsense. And bottom line was is that we did work, you know, and that's when we'd go underneath and iPads and and you know, guys were. You know, always watching the starters, as you knew, Dougie. Like the last start that the starter would have, it run from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. You have the starter on TV. But David and Manny were watching middle relief guys. They were watching similar 3-4 hitters, middle lineup guys, uh, Sheffield, Posada, uh, against these pitchers. And I'll tell you one quick story. We were playing in Cleveland facing CC Sabathia. And Sabathia, you know, he's 95, 96, hard slider. And – you know, I go downstairs and, you know, David and Manny are watching middle relief guys and they're watching the Yankees face the Clevelandians. And it was Baez was in that bullpen and, you know, whoever the, the hard right handers were in there and lefty. But I go, what are you guys doing? It's a very simple thing. We know what CeCe Sabathia has. He's fastball slider. He's coming in hard and that's what he does. He's power. But late in the game when he gets taken out, they would watch guys who they're going to be facing. That was a head, that, that was head and shoulders above, you know, different things because I was just watching the starter, you know, I was like, Oh, I got a starter. Mike Museum's on the mound. We got a fastball, <laughs> curveball, slider, cutter, you know? And so you're just kind of stressed out on the starter. These guys, they put that in their back pocket. They know what the starter had, but they were ready for the seventh, the eighth and the ninth innings. And that's what was amazing about these two guys, Manny and David and David, I'll tell you right now, turned into a very big student of the game and understood where pitchers were trying to get him out on. So he would sit, he would sit on a breaking ball or he would sit on that hard cheese in late in game. But he did serious damage because of the knowledge and never strayed away from a plan. Because hitting, you got to have a plan. It, you know, people always ask, how do you hit a fastball? How do you hit a curveball? How do you get – you have to have a plan. Sometimes that plan doesn't work, but there is a plan when you're walking to the plate. You understand if you're facing Jamie Moyer, you're trying to get the ball up, get him on the plate, Tom Glavin. And then you also understand if you're facing Kyle Farnsworth – coming in late in the game that he's throwing 100 miles an hour. You better get that head out. So there's always a plan. David was a big student of the game to kind of put that all into the repertoire. Let, let me ask you guys about two of the most amazing back-to-back -back games in postseason history. <laughs> you know which ones, right? This is These are games four and five of that ALCS in 2004. Uh, Yankees up three games to none. Sorry for bringing that up. <laughs> Then comes game four. I know everybody talks about the Dave Roberts steal off Mariano. I, I guess I should really say they talk about the Kevin Millar walk <laughs> that led to the Dave Roberts steal. <laughs> okay. But that just leads to the tying run in the ninth. So that game wasn't over. It's the, the walk-off bomb from David Ortiz in the 12th inning at 1.22 in the freaking morning <laughs> that ended that game. What do you two guys recall about that moment and how it changed that series? I, You know, for, for me, I, re I remember, I remember even down 3-0. I mean, I started game three and got and got beat. I'd been, I hadn't lost a game in a long time. Yeah. I hadn't lost any games to the Yankees up to that point. And, um, you know, getting beat 19-8 the night before, you know, we were pretty down in the dumps, but it was a very special locker room. And Kevin was, probably the, the biggest power mover inside that locker room of keeping optimism up, right? And and almost sarcastically being like, you know, um, you know, I got fishing plans, boys. We need to make sure we lose tonight so so, so we can get out of here, right? And and um, you know, some of that stuff was always going on. And I, I do remember before that game though, there was this thing going around in the locker room that the uh, in the newspaper they had printed that Gary Sheffield had said that those guys are a bunch of idiots, you know, something like that. And it was something that was supposed to be derogatory. And I don't know if it was even true or not, but somebody had printed that and they put them up all over the locker room. And, and I remember Kevin and a couple of guys still having that, you know, kind of the swag. It was like, you know, we're not, we're not out of this thing yet. And, and in the back of everyone's mind, or at least in my mind, I was a young guy, you know, I was, I had, I had never been even near a playoff game really um, until I got to Boston. And and so, you know, you're down 3-0. It's never been done before. You're thinking, we could be cooked here, but we're going to give them our best shot. And so for me, you know, David hitting that home run that night in game four and just giving us a little bit of breathing room. It felt like you just needed – that this team was so good that you just needed a little gap to, to, to get a, a breath and maybe we could come back in this thing. And, you know, he did that for us. And, that, and that's where – you started feeling like the team is riding this guy's back, right? He does that in game four. 
comes back and we're in the same situation in game five and, and things go down very similar. Well, Kevin, you were the guy yeah, who said, home don't let the Red Sox win tonight. <laughs> well, you won yeah. that night. <laughs> well, the Shaughnessy report when he called us frauds, you know, I was using the restroom that day going into game <laughs> four. We, we were obviously down three games and none. And that morning, that's back when we used to read the sports pages. Now everybody's got phones. But the Boston Globe, he, he said, uh, you know, it's a pack of frauds. And I remember that 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 kind of got me. So when I got to the clubhouse that day, you know, Dan Shaughnessy walked in and, you know, I remember just started yelling. I'm like, hey, nice hair, Dan. Your hair sucks. <laughs> and uh, and I started kind of, you know, ragging on him a little bit. And, you know, it started a little bit of like, OK. And then he came over and I'm like, frauds. I go to Pedro Martin, you know, Martinez a fraud. Is Trot Nixon a fraud? Is Jason Veritek a fraud? Is Big Poppy a fraud? They might be better than us. But you challenged our integrity when you're saying fraud. That's a big word. And at that point, you know, Poppy kind of, yeah, 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 whatever, Malasha, yeah, that's right. And he kind of started this little this little toughness, like, yeah. And that was the truth. And then I, after that, Shaughnessy came up to me, why are you so hard on me? And, and as we went out to for batting practice, and that's when it all happened with the boomstick was over our head. But I was like, don't let us win tonight. I don't know how we're going to do it. We had Derek Lowe, and that matchup didn't look good, but – don't let us win a night because we do. We got Pedro game five, Schilling game six, and anything happened game seven. But that game four, we're down, you know, in the ninth. You got Mariano trotting in. I walk. David Steele second. Roberts. Well, Billy Miller got the base hit to tie it up. So that's the big knock to get the run home. Once again, Billy ball game, base it up the middle. Now, now we go. You saw this little energy kind of go. And then obviously Paul Quantrill does the front door sinker. Poppy wins it and walks his mop. The next night, like Bronson said, we are in the same exact situation. I actually walked again, and we had the same situation go. It was magnified in game four, but you look at game five, David at Loiza was absolutely tremendous. It was like a 12-pitch at bat, battled to death, cutters and fastballs and sinkers and cutters. He ends up getting the base at the center field, fist it. Now we win. We walk off back-to-back nights. Big Poppy does it both. And you saw this. And when I tell you the truth, there was no pressure on us. There was no pressure on us. It The momentum just swung to our clubhouse. And the Yankees were scared now. And they understood even though we were going into New York, there was something going on now because they were supposed to kind of just go ahead and sweep us. It's never happened, this and that. And we had this swag kind of keep going like, yeah. And it all started from one Sheffield Collins idiots, if that was the case. But the main thing for me was the Dan Chauncey interview calling us a pack of frauds. And I think that that we rallied around that and the boxes became on top of the locker instead of pulling the boxes down the pack for the off season. <laughs> we know those years, but we weren't doing that. Now it was let's go to game six and let's go. And then game seven, we had a chance to shock the world. And rarely do you get to leave your hotel room saying if we win tonight, we could shock this world. And that's basically how it all kind of came. And once we got to game seven, it was over. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just want to think about what happened in those 24 hours. Cause the first walk off <laughs> hit is at one twenty two AM. <laughs> yeah. The second one was somewhere like around 11, right? That was theoretically, that was a day game. It just <laughs> it, it ended at almost midnight, but two walk off hits in the same day in October, I, you guys might know this stat, but I'll ask you, how many other players have ever had two walk-off hits in the same postseason series? That's none. And David Ortiz had two on one day.